The following message was recorded live at Crossroads Church, a grace-centered community in central Alberta. Good morning. Happy Thanksgiving. It's such a privilege uh, to be here this morning on this Thanksgiving with you. And how Thanksgiving is just a great time for us to spend a little bit of time reflecting. And as I've been thinking about this week, I, I've been in a high reflecting mode. Uh, last week we were here in church and as I was thinking about what this last season was like, I was hearing this little squawk over and over again, a little, like just, and this little child is just moving her limbs everywhere and you can't control her and I was reminded of this little baby. And some of you don't know this, uh, but our seven month old, uh, was, was born with a, a significant kind of heart, heart problem. And he, this is Jovi. And as I was reflecting, I was thinking about this, this season that we've gone to, through and how challenging it's been. And yet at the same time about how good God's presence has been and how faithful has, God has been through it and how faithful our church and friends have been through this process. And, and just thinking through that, now we've got this little girl who is squawking, who is wiggly. She was over here making a ton of noise earlier. Um, and now she is like almost seven months old. You can go to that next picture. And just thriving. Her, her open heart surgery just went fantastic. Both of those holes in her heart have just closed up. She is just functioning so well. And I couldn't help but just uh, be here last week reflecting and thinking, thank you, God. <laughs> Thank you, God, for what you've done. Thank you, God, for how gracious you've been. Thank you, God, for sustaining us through this challenging season. And this morning, uh, without much delay, I want to take us on a journey that will allow us to experience and greater understand the goodness of God. My hope this morning is that we would be able to get a picture of God's goodness and a picture of who he is, that out of that understanding of who God is, who his character is, we couldn't help but leave this place and just say thank you. And that the response from knowing more about this God would cause us, regardless of where we're at in our faith walk, whether you, you know a whole lot about Jesus, whether you've thought a whole lot about Jesus, whether you're all in or all out, by experiencing and understanding who this God is, your heart, your mind, your life might be drawn just a little bit closer to him this morning. Now, before we get to our passage, uh, I just need to give you a warning. We are going to be diving in knee deep into a story that is kind of already set in motion. It, it's already gone, and so I need to give you a little bit of context, okay? So we're jumping out of Revelation, where Dan has been, and we're going to take a small vacation, just for this week, in, in the book of Exodus. And in the book of Exodus, what is happening is the Israelites have just been delivered out of slavery, okay? So they had all this slavery in Egypt. God has delivered them through miracle after miracle, they come to the Red Sea, uh, God parts the Red Sea, and all the people walk across on dry land. At every turn, Israel has seen God's goodness. They've experienced God's goodness. They've seen him provide for their needs. They've seen him feed them. And over and over again, God has been nothing but gracious to them. And where we pick up in the story is Moses is up on the mountain receiving what we know as the Ten Commandments. And as Moses is up with God, receiving the Ten Commandments, the people have a great idea, and it's really brilliant. They decide, you know, we're going to take all of our jewelry, all of our gold, and we're going to throw it in the fire, and we are going to form an idol for us to worship. Because this God hasn't done enough for us already. We need, we need to follow something else. And where we pick up is utter chaos has ensued upon the Israelites. Uh, they've made God upset. The community is deeply shaken. 
The nation is in turmoil about what's next. And they are left wondering if God's presence and goodness will go with them. And where we find ourselves is Moses uh, goes to God to intercede on behalf of the people. And in, in chapter 33, verse 18, Moses is in the middle of this dialogue with God. And what this dialogue looks like is Moses is begging God. He is begging God. He says, God, please do not give up on your people. Please don't abandon us. God, please would you go with us. God, after all you've done, please don't, don't do away with us now. And as they're dialoguing, God says, yes, I'll do that. I'll do that for you. I will go with you. And in the midst of this dialogue that's going on about Israel and about the nation, Moses actually flips into a different mode. And his mode is, God, and in light of you going with us, I just, I want to know you more. God, yes, we've interacted before. I, I know about you, we've, we've done life together, I've been in relationship with you, but I want to know you more. Would you reveal yourself to me? And so Moses makes this request in verse 18, and he says this, he says, Lord, would you show me your glory? And, and the request that Moses is making, he's asking the Lord, would you show me the full weight, the full essence of your character, so that, I might know you more and be able to follow you. Our hope this morning is, is actually to have a similar question like Moses. Would you show us who you are so that we might be able to follow you a little bit more? And the Lord agrees with Moses. The Lord says, yes, you know what, Moses? I'll reveal myself to you. I'll show you who I am. And, and the Lord says, tomorrow, come up on the mountain and I'll reveal my glory to you. And so Moses, the next morning, gets up, goes up to the mountain to meet with God. And in chapter 34, verse 5, it says this. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord. The Lord, the Lord. What he's saying here is this. Hey, Moses, pay attention. I'm about to reveal myself. I'm going to repeat my name. Yahweh, Yahweh. Also known as, as the Lord's salvation name. The Lord, the Lord. The compassionate and gracious God. Slow to anger. Abounding in love and faithfulness. Maintaining love to thousands. And forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation. There's a ton of richness in these two chapters and we're just gonna, we're gonna dive right in and just make a couple observations about how God reveals himself to Moses. And, and the first thing that I notice, I don't know if you notice this, is is. God could say anything to Moses about who he is. He could say anything. And yet he picks to say this. And my first observation really is, is what God doesn't say. Because if God could say anything and yet he says this, why doesn't he say some other things? Why doesn't God say the Lord Almighty, creator, maker of heaven and earth, the, the one who will judge the living and the dead, the one who knows all, who is nothing like you, the one who wouldn't have blown it like you did with the golden calf. Out of everything the Lord could pick to say to Moses, this is what he says. This is the peace that God is trying to reveal to Moses. The Lord, the Lord, compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin, yet not leaving the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation. 
The picture I get here is it is if the Lord has silenced all of heaven and earth to get their attention to say, this is who I am. Forget what you've heard about me. Forget what you think you know about me. Hear it from my lips right now. This is who I am. Some of you, Moses, some of you congregation, think that I'm cold and distant and heartless. Some of you think I'm like Santa Claus who's just like merry and happy and jolly all the time. Some of you think I delight in punishing and condemning people. Let me set the record straight. This is who I am. This is who I am. I'm the Lord. Compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. As the Lord's revealing himself to Moses, he, he starts with this statement, the compassionate and gracious God. And the picture we are given here in the Hebrew word of compassion is actually the picture of God caring for his children like a mother caring for her small child. The word compassion is so closely connected to the word womb, we are meant to understand that God is saying, like the intimacy and protective nature of a womb, of a child being a womb, so God cares for his children. This is who I am. And this picture has become really significant for me uh, because I, I've actually, I feel like I've been able to see it firsthand in the last seven months. I shared with you about Jovi. And I've been able to watch my wife with Jovi day in, day out, sacrifice everything for this child. For this child who could not put on weight, for this child who could not sleep, for this child who screamed over everything, wouldn't eat, like on and on and on. I watched day after day Julie's attention, her eyes, her every moment thinking about how can I care for Jovi. She sacrificed sleep, she sacrificed even getting out of the house. She sacrificed her own hygiene. <laughs> you, you, and, and yet she filled with compassion. On the other hand, you know, I'm just saying, let the kid cry it out. You know, she'll figure it out. And yet everything in her couldn't help, couldn't help but care for Jovi. That is the picture. That is the type of attention that the Lord gives us here. The Lord says, I'm compassionate and gracious and I will treat each one of my children, each one of the people who follow me, each person, like I created them in my womb and I'll do whatever it takes to help them. Do whatever it takes. The Lord goes on to say, not only am I gracious and compassionate, not only do I look on my kids with that kind of attention and, and intimacy, but I am slow to anger. Now this is interesting. All of us have probably witnessed someone who is quick to anger. I mean, if we were to actually take a recall of the last week, we could probably remember story after story of someone who was quick to anger, not probably slow. We'd remember who was quick. I mean, I was in the grocery store this last week uh, picking up some groceries. And as I walk in, I notice that everyone is paying attention to this man because he is losing his mind. I'm thinking, what is going on here? And maybe it was one of you, so I'm sorry. <laughs> but he's losing his mind because he happened to pick up the wrong shopping basket. You know, the ones with the wheels instead of the handle. And he just thought that was ridiculous. And so he's dropping bombs and carrying this thing and just chucks it back and goes in the store. And I'm thinking, man, that's... I'll remember that. This is good for my talk this week. Um, <laughs> but it doesn't take much to look around and see that we're saturated in a culture that is quick to become angry. Think about your own story. How many of us carry a burden on our back because of the quickness to anger someone has inflicted on us? 
Think, of, think about central Alberta. What are, what are we actually known for? One of the things we're known for is the amount of domestic abuse in, in our area. A quickness to anger. To fly off the handle when, when we get the wrong chopping basket. <laughs> or for some of us, it's actually been a great deeper wound. And yet, the picture we're given here is a God who is slow to anger. The word used here, it's a really interesting word, is because it actually says that uh, slow to anger, the Hebrew word means long-nosed. I know that sounds interesting. Uh, but it's the picture of the nose is where breath comes from, and it is through breathing that our emotions are actually expressed. And we see that God is not one who snorts like a bull and is quick to anger. But rather, we have a God who is slow to anger and takes deep breaths. Have you seen this with a little child? You've seen this? Uh, so last week, we're playing, me and my daughter Cody, we're building some blocks, and Daddy decides to do something dumb, and so he comes on and knocks over her blocks because we're playing. Yeah, that wasn't kind, I know. We'll talk about that later. She's gonna need counseling. I need to listen to my own sermon. Okay, we've, that's all for chess. So anyhow, Daddy does something not very nice. Instantly, her reaction is, snap, clinch fist. <laughs> but she's just... And she is just, her little body is just <laughs> raging. And what is the process that I work with her on? You say, okay. Well, first daddy says he's sorry. That's probably a good place to start. But I get down with her and I say, hey, okay, we need to slow down a little bit. You need to take a deep breath. It's in the Lord's character to breathe deeply with his creation. Even in their worst moments, he does not react, snort, or have a short fuse. He's patient with his children. I mean, look at what Dan has just been talking about this last week, last couple weeks, about the churches in Revelation. How incredibly patient the Lord was with each church. He sends them messages, he speaks to them, he encourages them, and he gives them time. You know what I'm grateful for? God doesn't just do this with like nations like Israel or with churches. But this is how I experience God to be personally. Have you experienced God's slowness to anger? I know when I look at my life, for the last 12 years, the Lord has been speaking to me over and over and over again about the same thing. And for seasons, I turn it around. I choose to follow him and what he's asked me. But eventually what ends up happening is like a dog returns to a vomit, it's vomit, I end up going right back to the same thing over and over again. And once again, I'm in a season where the Lord's asked me, would you listen to me and would you follow me in this? And, and I'm trying to follow him, but it is so difficult. And, and I sit here, I stand here, and I'm amazed that God just hasn't washed his hands of me I'm amazed that he hasn't just given up on me and that the Lord has been incredibly patient. And yet at the same time, I'm super embarrassed <laughs> because I haven't been able to figure this out yet. I'm grateful that he's slow to anger. However, I'm beginning to realize that just because he's slow to anger does not mean he never gets angry. There is actually a point where his patience runs out. And there, there's no set time frame or formula to know when this will happen because we serve a God who is relational and works with individuals. I mean, maybe you're in a place where you've heard the Lord speak to you for some time about something. Maybe you're in a place where you, you've heard him speak and you've been ignoring him or you've been running for, from him. Know today that he is actually slow to anger and slow in dealing with you. But my encouragement for all of us is that his slowness to anger would actually lead us 
to learn to follow him. That we would allow his kindness and his graciousness to lead us to repentance. Encourage us not to wait to see what happens when his breath runs out, because it does. And maybe today is an opportunity for us to be thinking about a place or an area where God's been calling us and it's time to turn it around. Begin the process. Just as I am grateful that the Lord is slow to anger and patient, I want you to know I'm equally grateful that he gets angry. And what, what do I mean by that? Well, who would God be if he was not frustrated and challenged and angry over the pain and sin in the world caused by humanity? Who would God be if he did not get angry over the desolation that is occurring in Syria? Who would God be if he was not angry over the plight of millions of refugees all over the world who have been displaced because some man wanted power? Who would God be? Who would God be if he wasn't angry about the vulnerable, weak, and hurting in our own backyard who aren't getting any help? You know what I think he'd be? He'd be calloused, and he'd be heartless, and he'd be cold. His anger reveals his love for us and his longing to make all things that are wrong in this world right. Now his love, it it goes beyond just being slow to anger. It's a great picture. But the next piece, after his graciousness and his compassion and his slow to anger, he gives us this picture of abounding in love and faithfulness. And the challenge with this statement is I feel like Each one of these Hebrew words, they they just are wrapped up in so much. This word abounding in love and faithfulness, there is actually so much to it that's wrapped up in the picture of relationship. And so the best way to describe it is through a picture and a thought. For those of you who are married, do you remember those days before your engagement? Do you remember being in love and and processing and thinking about that person and sitting down and, you know, you were talking to people about, is this the one? And and you're asking yourself lots of questions. Um, This is is the picture here. The, The Hebrew word is hesed, and I think about a couple who is analyzing a proposal. The groom has dropped to one knee and is about to propose. The bride-to-be is thinking through, does this person have what it takes to build a life with? Do they have the characteristics I'm looking for in a spouse? And the picture of God's abounding love and faithfulness is the ability to be able to say a confident yes. Yes, he does. At the root of the word, hesed, or abounding in love, God is communicating to us that when you tie yourself up with the Lord, when you engage yourself with the Lord, when you are married to the Lord, when you commit to him, he can't help but take care of you and me. You will not be left at the altar. You won't be abandoned five years down the road when it gets rough. This is a God who is not wrapped up in how he feels about you, but is committed to love you no matter what. A love that is loyal, full of mercy and kindness. What a picture for God to give Moses after they've just blown it. (laughs) After they've just screwed up with this golden calf. This is a love that does not quit when the passion is gone. This is a love that does not back out on you when things get rough. This is a love that does not run dry. It never fails. It never gives up. And it will never run out on you. Nothing can cripple this kind of love. Nothing can hinder it. Nothing can destroy it. 
Nothing can stand in the way of this love. It is a river that cannot be quenched, a force that cannot be reckoned with. It cannot be squashed, overcome, or overpowered, and his love will endure forever. That is the picture that God is trying to communicate to us, a love that we just do not understand because so often our own love is motivated out of how we feel. And when Paul writes in Romans chapter eight that he is convinced that neither death nor life nor anything else can separate us from the love of Christ Jesus our Lord, he is correct. When we enter into relationship with God, We have confidence that he will not abandon us and that he is in it with us for the long haul. The the next piece of his abounding love and faithfulness or in his revealing of himself to Moses is, is this comment that he forgives wickedness, rebellion, and sin. And then the comment, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sins of the parents of the third and fourth generation. This loyalty and relationship does not come with the expectation of perfect performance because clearly Israel already doesn't measure up. right? They've already blown it. You and I don't measure up. The Lord has never been about demanding perfect performance. He knows that as humans we are fragile, prone to wander, and bent on our own destruction. You know, it is actually no news to him that some of us have gone this last week and just thrown our lives in a garbage bin. No news to him that many of us have actually blown it. And and like a dog who's returned to his vomit, we've gotten back to things that we don't want to be about. It's not news to him. And yet what God is trying to communicate to Moses is this about his character. Out of all the things I could say about who I am, I need you to know that I forgive. That is the essential part of God's DNA. And it isn't just I forget the little things. I don't just forget, forgive the little middle class sins. The, the, not not the, just the shallow stuff. God uses words to describe how abundant his forgiveness is. He uses words like, I forgive wickedness. I forgive the darkest deeds. I forgive the skeletons in your closet, the things that you and I would cringe over if they were brought to light, the things in our lives that bring about the most shame and regret and pain. These things are not too much for the Lord to forgive. And not only does he use this word of forgives wickedness, but he, he goes one step further. You know what else I forgive? Outright rebellion. When people put their fist in the air and they say, I don't need you, God, and they use a bunch of other explicitives, <laughs> and they stick it to the Lord and they say, I'm going to do my own thing even though I know it's not right. I'm going to be obstinate. And you would think, and I would think, in our love, our type of love for people, well, that's your choice then. I'll just be in relationship with somebody else, right? But the Lord cares so much that we understand this piece of forgiveness that he says, I forgive that too. I wonder, in all those things, I wonder if you actually need to embrace his forgiveness today. He has an incredible amount of grace for us when we come and repent and confess. He has compassion for us as we turn for our sinful ways. And whoever comes and humbles themselves will not be turned away. I love that. But in the midst of that, God is also just. And so God makes uh, this statement about not leaving the guilty unpunished. But to those who are too proud and will not humble themselves before the Lord and turn from their ways, they'll be responsible before God and will face the consequences of their sin and rebellion. And the interesting thing that God says here is he actually takes it one step forward. Hey, if you won't humble yourselves and come and receive forgiveness for me, 
that's free? I'm actually not expecting a ton, just ask and try to follow. He says, if you won't do that, I just need you to know that your sin and the, your stubbornness actually will not only affect you, but it's gonna affect your kids. What God is not saying is, is he's not saying that he's gonna punish your kids for the things they didn't do. He's not saying that. What he is communicating is that your actions and my actions and choices, whether good or bad, have significant effects on our families. And our kids will reap what we sow. Think about this with me for a second. How many of us have experienced this reality? We've grown up in a home where the sins of your father and mother have consequences on your life today. And you carry around baggage and pain that was inflicted on you because of their poor choices. It doesn't actually take long to, for some of us to think through some of those things. Or on the flip side, you've seen the blessing that has come from your parents who have made wise, godly decisions and have experienced joy and seen his abounding love in your home. And this is why the Lord is saying, if you will commit yourself to me, if you'll be wrapped up in my abounding love, if you'd say yes to me, I'll surround your family. I'll help you so that your children might not experience your pain, challenges, and suffering because it, remember you talked about the abounding love, maintaining love to thousands. It's talking about that that would be passed down. Without God's help, we cannot care for our families the way God intended. However, with God's help, we might be able to pass on a legacy that transforms our whole family line, that we be able to see his abounding love in our family for generations. Now that's, that's really easy to, to speak out there, but then when I start to bring that closer to home, I think about my kids. I think about Cody and Jovi. And I think about my own shortcomings. I think about my own sin, my own rebellion, I think about the stuff that wraps me up. My disposition to worry and anxiety. Uh, how fear cripples me at times. I think about my greed and my selfishness. And I think to myself, God, if you do not help me, these girls are in a world of trouble. God, if you don't help me understand your abounding love, if you don't help me to be in relationship with you, if you don't help me figure this out, I don't want it to be too late for my kids. And so my kids they actually motivate me to become like this God. My kids motivate me, and it, the role reversal is like, Lord, how can I actually become like you so that my kids might experience a legacy? that would be surrounded with your abounding love and faithfulness. That they'd have a dad who is gracious and compassionate. That they have a dad who was slow to anger and didn't fly off the handle and knock over their blocks. Um, <laughs> but that, that a legacy would start to form. I'm, I'm reminded of longing for a legacy, and yet there's some of us who are just in the place right now where we're like, man, I just want to walk out of here with my tail between my legs because I realize I have just blown it for my kids. And, it, and I haven't thought about it. I haven't thought about it just affecting my life, but it actually affects my kids. And, and, and that's, man, that's a, it's like a gut check. But the Lord is holistic in what he's talked about here. And so the beautiful part about building a legacy and maintaining love to thousands of generations just means start today. And I love that about the Lord. I love that about him is he, he is slow with us. He's patient with us. 
What would Central Alberta look like if you and I decided to start a legacy today that would maintain love to thousands? What would Central Alberta look like if we actually would say, God, we see this picture of you and we want to we wanna tie ourselves up with you? I think the picture would start to change around us. Instead of our, our city, our community being known for anger, being known for addiction, being known for abandonment, I think it would start to be known for something different. If we would tie ourselves up with this God, there's no telling what God could do. As we, as we kind of wrap up this picture, and we see how God's kind of displayed to us who he is, I, I just, I'm, I'm wrestling with, with one question, and just a couple of thoughts, but in closing, the one question I'm wrestling with is, um, how do we trust that God is actually who he says he is? How do we know today that who he says he is is actually true? I, I've heard someone say once, is, they said, talk is cheap, love has feet. So don't just talk it. Don't just tell us that you're full of compassion. Don't just tell us you're slow to anger. Don't just tell us you're abounding in love and faithfulness. Don't just tell us that you forgive. Prove it. Prove it. And I'm overwhelmed to know that we have a God that said, done. I'll prove it. You know how I'll prove it? I'll prove it like this. The word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. Jesus Christ became man and stepped into the neighborhood and said, I am proving to you that this is a God who does not just talk a good game, but he's willing to live it. I am proving to you that I am compassionate and gracious. I have come to heal the sick. I have come to deliver the oppressed. I'm slow to anger. Even when you beat me and you put me on a cross, I will not lose my temper. I am a God who, who forgives sin. In fact, uh, my sole purpose of coming is so that you might have freedom from sin. God proves it to us with Jesus. And Jesus is the one who makes a way for us to begin and relate to God in this relationship, abounding in love, this engagement, this tying ourselves up with the Lord. And by Jesus coming, the, God opens the doors and says, let anyone, anyone, Anyone can come and taste this, can experience this kind of love. Talk is cheap. It is. Love has feet. And love came to us in the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, just in closing, I, my last slide is just thinking about this. Is that, what do we do with the rest of this passage? And my, my encouragement to us, this is Thanksgiving. You know, lots of us have different traditions of things that we kind of think about what we're thankful for. My encouragement is this. What would it look like as you're stuffing your faces with turkey to dwell on this passage and think through how God has been gracious to you and compassionate? Where has he been gracious to you? I mean, I gotta remind, I'll sit down later today and I'll hold Jovi and I'll just think through, God, man, you've just been so gracious. I don't know how this has happened. Where has God been gracious to you? Maybe it's thinking, where has God been slow to anger with you and, and God's reminding you that's what you need to dwell on, is that he's been slow to anger with you and, and as you're thinking through that, you're thinking, yeah, his slow, oh man, I need to realign. I need to be thinking about that a little bit more. Maybe you need forgiveness today. You need to dwell on the fact that he forgives those things and, and you just need to come and ask him for it. 
I think that would be a great way to close this, to close this passage up. Is that we would stand back and look at this God and say, this is who he is. Thank you. God, you are good. And as we walk out of this place, we would just be drawn a little closer to following him and wanting to know him today. Oh, would you stand with me? And I'm gonna pray. Moses' response uh, as God reveals himself to him is he just has one response. He says nothing back to God when God says, this is who I am. Moses' one response is to fall on his face and worship. And so we're just gonna close with just saying, thank you, Lord. <laughs> thank you for who you are. Thank you that you, this is the type of God we serve. Thank you for revealing yourself to us, not only in word, but also in person. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for today. Father, I, my heart is just so grateful that you are gracious and compassionate, that you are slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, uh, that, that you maintain love to thousands and yet you forgive wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Thank you, Lord, for your justice. Father, as we go today, we just have one response. And we just wanna say thank you. Thank you for who you are, amen.